Okay, um, so I'm going to do, uh, now that you've learned to use Gen 5 and develop Gen 5, now it's contributing to Gen 5. We are a completely open source, full source project in all sense. We allow outside uh, people to contribute, in fact, we encourage it, if you have anything of use. And I'm going to go over the various ins and outs of that, starting off from basically how to use Git correctly to do so, as well as our procedures, style guide, etc. Uh, so if you have any interest whatsoever in being part of this community, uh, this session's for you. Yeah, the Gen 5 Simulator is an open source collaborative project. Anyone willing to submit a contribution may do so, and they will be evaluated and incorporated if suitable. This can be anything, I kind of, we kind of always focus on code or bug fixes, but this can even be documentation updates. In fact, we really welcome documentation updates. Some of our documentation is really out of date. Uh, I focus mostly on the Gen 5 uh, code repo here, but we have the Gen 5 website, which is, again, which is actually uh, the source is a Git repo, and you can update that as well with documentation updates. Anything on the project is open source and can be contributed to, so we welcome almost anything. And the reason we're doing this is uh, we, this is kind of our strategy here. Uh, we, you, you like learn, and then you use, and then through the use of Gen 5, you'll probably develop new things. And when you develop new things, you contribute to Gen 5. And then when you contribute to Gen 5, Gen 5 improves, and we get increased interest, and more people want to learn. So this whole boot camp is sort of like getting more people in the first part of the search cycle so we can continue this virtuous cycle and have more people using, developing, contributing, improving, and increasing interest in Gen 5. So this is kind of why we do these sorts of things, and this is why learning to contribute and contributing your changes is uh, helpful to us. So why should you contribute? I mean, kind of, these are some reasons. First of all, you're nice and community-minded. Uh, you found a bug, you fixed it. Please, by all means, just push the fi fix. However, it, however, in, in like whatever way you can, we don't have the time to fix every single bug in Gen 5. It's just not feasible. If you can, if you can fix bug for us, that's great. Of course, other one, you've just developed something truly useful and want to share it. And this is your way of giving back to a software project that's free for you to use, completely open source, and has helped you in your research. Second, is maybe you're not so selfless, but you just want good advertisement for your research. So most researchers use, use Gen 5, and in doing so, have expanded the code base in some capacity. And uh, just sharing it, uh, and just sharing it and making it part of Gen 5 project can be sometimes good advertisement for for your research. Maybe it makes your research more easy to use, easy, easier to replicate, etc. Uh, there's a kind of caveat here. I would say be careful. We don't necessarily want completely niche, very, very bespoke code in the code base that's of no use to anyone else. But generally, if it's general purpose improvement, maybe a new framework, maybe a new model that is out in the market and you want to research, yeah, please, please contribute that. Uh, and honestly, we don't maybe say this completely as like part of our con contract with the community, but the more you help us, the more we're probably willing to help you in your research. If you're someone who has contributed quite a bit and you come to us saying, hey, can you help me with this? We're probably gonna say yes. Whereas if you haven't helped us at all ever and you come to us asking for help, probably less likely to. Gen5 is a community. All communities are kind of give and take. So the more you contribute, the more we're willing to help out when you need our help. That's just the nature of these things. So something to keep in mind. And just because a lot of you are young and probably in your PhD here, or uh, masters even, uh, it's completely open source. Once you contribute to Gen 5, it will be on our Git repo forever, <laughs> recorded that you have contributed this. And honestly, it looks quite good to employers if you can point towards stuff that's open source and actually they can read, not behind some non-disclosure agreement that you have created and contributed to. It just looks quite good. We don't mind you putting in your CV that you have contributed to Gen 5, if of course you have. Just link to your commit or your, or your pull request or your page on GitHub. It'd be quite good. Uh, it's, I've certainly had some benefit in just, you know, I've, never, I've not been on, the, been on the job market in a long time, but people have found my code on GitHub and emailed me about it and like, you know, so it's all public and like a lot of stuff you might do as part of a private corporation. So it's a good thing to half kicking around. I'm scared to contribute. It's kind of the feeling I get a lot from people when I ask them about contributing their work to Gen 5. 
Uh, that's understandable. I just think there's a few things to keep in mind with this. I think one of the biggest fears is they're going to have their changes rejected and feel stupid. Every single person who's contributed from Gen 5 long enough has their I've had their changes rejected. I've got like, I was going to say 25. It was way more than that. I've had so many patches I've pushed to Gen 5. I work on this full time. And someone in the community will point out that it's really not that good of a, good of an, I, good of a thing. And, talk, and they'll talk me out of it. And they, that just happens. The reasons for this are never really are never personal, actually. No one's ever rejected something because they don't like me or because they think I'm stupid. They just think, no, I'd maybe you know, there's better ways to do this. This isn't really suitable, or this won't really work the way you think it will. A uh, nice thing as part of GitHub is a pull request is never really gone. You can close a pull request, but the pull request is still there. It's there forever. You can still reference it if you need to, and you, we can still resurrect it at a future date if we find out it would, will be of use. So don't worry about that sort of side of things. It happens to the best of developers. Um, secondly, the Gen 5 devs are really nice people, and they're not trying to be mean. When, when they critique your code, we're trying our best to be constructive. I, we try our best not to say things like, this is wrong, go away and rewrite it, because it's very unhelpful. Like, we try to explain why it's wrong, what you should do, and what the alternative is. It really is a constructive process, and again, it's nothing personal. Uh, I know on the internet it's really hard to insinuate tone from critical, from critical feedback, but I work with these people all the time, and when they say that it's better off if this class has moved here, they're not saying it to be um, mean or annoying, it's just they are literally just giving a suggestion they think would make the, the project better, or your patch better. Um, if I've not seen a a uh, change submitted to Gen 5 of any real magnitude, not go through several iterations back and forth of people saying, no, actually, could you do this? No, actually, I think this would be better. No, are you sure this is better? Maybe, maybe, maybe move this here. Maybe you rewrite this part. It is exhausting, but it's not something you should feel emotionally scared or negatively towards. It's just part of the process. And I've seen like five or six iterations of by pushing the, the, the change until it eventually gets accepted. If you fear this, you shouldn't, because I, I, yeah, again, anything of any real magnitude, anything more than a few lines of code changes always seems to go through this process. So I wouldn't worry too much about it. Another reason people are scared is they feel like they're not a Gen 5 expert in some capacity, like, or they don't understand the code fully. No one understands Gen 5 fully. I wouldn't, say, I wouldn't even say there's probably someone out there who understands 50% of Gen 5 fully. It just, it's a huge project. It's been around for 20 years. It's massive. There's parts that I don't know. There's parts that, parts that Jason don't know. There's parts that no one knows. Um, if you feel like you've got a very small part of the code base you understand and you can improve it, and maybe you don't understand everything that's connected to it, that's fine. Push it. We'll try our best to understand it. And and, and involve it, you do not need to be a Gen 5 expert to contribute to Gen 5, because I would argue there's probably never going to be a Gen 5 expert exist ever again. It's too complex. It's too big. Uh, so yeah. So yeah, don't feel discouraged. Everyone starts somewhere. We'll hopefully help you. So yeah, don't be too scared. What can you contribute? Well, first of all, the kind of most obvious part is if you've got something you feel, feel is meaningful to contribute, bug fixes and features and improvements to existing features you feel might be good. Documentation updates, always welcome. We, we can never have enough people write, writing documentation. I know you're all, soft, you're all tech people. You hate communicating using English language and talking to people. But if you've got that in you, great. We always welcome more documentation. Sometimes people come to us and say, I just want to contribute to Gen 5 because I kind of want to contribute to open source project, or I've got, I've got some spare time I want something to do. We do have an issues page on GitHub uh, that you can go through. Some people just, you know, if, I don't, know, I don't think a week goes by before, without someone pointing out something slightly not right, and then leaving it to the community to fix for them. If you want to jump in and do that for us, that's absolutely great. Just respond to the issue and say, hey, can I work on this? We'll probably just say yes. And you can go away and fix it if you want. Or it's so always bug fixes. Sometimes it's just feature requests, like, oh, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be better if this worked like this? And we go, yeah, but we don't have the time to implement it right now. Stuff like that. Feel free to go through uh, and look forward. And if you want to contribute to Gem 5. Oh, can't I contribute? I don't mean this to sound super negative. It's just more kind of disclaimers. And there's always corner cases in this. So don't take anything here too seriously. 
Um, but yeah, I'd say anything that is that you can see as a burden to maintain. So anything that you see as like, oh, I'll I'll like contribute this, and us as the Gen5 community are going to have to maintain it indefinitely for 20 years' time. Um, you get around this for writing lots of tests to make sure we know where it fails, and uh, it really depends on kind of what part of the project it is. But we want to find this kind of usability feature utility. VS kind of long-term maintenance trade-off we're always kind of thinking about here. So if it's something very large, complex, and only seems to do have a minor benefit, we might say, oh, maybe not this time. You know, we don't want to be burdened with with like maintaining this. Again, uh, not really something I think a lot of people have to involve themselves with. Uh, and if you're worried, just you can just message us in advance and say, hey, I've got this feature. Do you think it'll be of use to you? I'm, I'm sure we can give a pretty quick assessment whether that would be useful for the community and whether we can. Uh, we have the resources to maintain it longer term. A big problem is number two here, and, and this will be more relevant when we start to, when I start to teach you about how to incorporate testing. Uh, but it's just something we can't validate, or we couldn't validate in the future. Um, sometimes we will push a patch, and then we go, "How do we know this works the way you say it does?" And it's kind of like trust me, bro, sort of situation. And that never is very that never seems to work out in our favor because trusting people's code is correct is never a good look. Anything you can push to kind of that also validates the correctness of your patch or change is really great. And obviously, the most easiest way to do that is to provide testing with your feature changes. So that's another thing. Uh, again, if we reject because we can't validate it's correct, it's not really us being mean. It's just we can't risk incorporating something that's extremely buggy. We need some way that you have checked this is correct. Um, Fourth is it uh, doesn't conform to our standards. Typically here, we mean style guidelines. So the code's fine. We don't see anything wrong with it, but it's just not formatted in the right way. For example, this is a very common reason to reject a patch. It's also a very common way to fix, a very easy way for you to fix fix your patch. And we're going to go over. I'm going to go over that in a bit. So you know, oh hey, there, your your line length here is too long. So we're so we're rejecting it from now on. You just have to push again with that line length fixed. It's very a very common problem. So let's get started. Um, what I'm going to go through here is um, I'm going to go through the kind of step-by-step -step process of how you how you contribute to Gem5, right down to how you work your local Git repository and how you would push a pull request. So if you pushed a pull request to any repository before, a lot of this might seem a bit redundant, but we do have uh, some little caveats in Gem5 that you have to watch out for that I'll mention as we go along here. So um, I'm not asking you to do this directly, but the way we work is through a pull request model. So the first thing you would do is fork here by pressing this. I'm not actually going to, I think it'll come up an error because Jason's sort. But you'd fill out this here to create a fork. You'd have to have your own GitHub account. And then the important thing to mention here is unclick this button and create your fork. I'm not going to do this in Jason's account here, but that's what you do. And a fork is essentially a copy of the Gen5 repository that you own and can modify in like, in like whatever way you work, in, sorry, in, in like whichever way you want. And when you want to contribute some of that change to the actual Gen5 repository, you'd create what we call a pull request, which we can then merge these changes in. The important thing I want to mention here is you 100% want to untick this button because we don't actually work on top of the stable branch. We work on top of the develop branch. And that means your fork should have the develop branch in it to work correctly. And again, then you will eventually clone your uh, Giant 5 repo using uh, this one, this, uh, well, whatever, whatever, whatever your GitHub account is. So for me, for example, I'm going to go back here. So I know that I have uh, mine is uh, Bobby Arbus at Jam Five. And I'm just gonna. So this is me cloning my fork locally here. My fork of Jam Five. Yep, so this is just, it's exactly like the Gen5 repo, but I own it and I can, I can make modifications to it as I see fit. That's kind of the first step. 
will do kind of thing. And it's really useful just to have your own work with Jam 5 to do your own work in. I think if you're pretty much doing any work with Jam 5 at all, it's probably worthwhile making a fork um, and kind of using it as your own kind of uh, sandbox for a Jam 5 work. So, yeah. So I'm going to go through some tip, some uh, things here. Just kind of good housekeeping tips. And you're going to use my little Gem5 local fork as the example here. Uh, you can play along uh, by yourself, or just kind of pay attention to what I'm doing here. First of all, you'll start off in the stable branch. This is the latest stable release of Gem5. So if I could get log here, you can see this is. Uh, sorry, I thought I would say what version. It Anyway, this is version 24.0. I want to go to the, I want to make changes to Jam 5, so I'm going to go to the develop branch. I will switch develop, switch develop. And then, if I want to make changes, I would create, a, I would create a new branch from develop. So I'd create a copy of develop branch C. I want to call this my, my changes. Let's see, my uh, changes, and then I can see. Then I can get switch into that branch, into my changes. So I can work on top of this branch and kind of like play with it. It keeps everything nice and neat. So I think the two kind of things I want to keep in mind here. First of all, definitely work from the develop branch. Second, I'll copy, create a copy of the develop branch and work from it because it's nice to keep your develop branch nice and neat and tidy and in sync with the current Gen 5, current Gen 5 develop branch. It just makes development a lot easier. I think this might become clear in the next few slides. Um, so uh, it's really, really good to keep your repo up to date, your fork repo up to date with the main Gen 5 repo. There's various ways to do this. Uh, I'm going to the two, two above here. I don't want you to necessarily try, but you can go to the GitHub, your GitHub page. So if I go to, uh, I won't be able to do it because I'm not logged in as myself here. But if I go to my Bobby R Boost Gem Five page, you'll see a button there that just says something like Sync Fork, and it'll sync these forks for me. So the stable branch and the develop branch will, can be updated from the GitHub UI. Second is you can use the uh, you use the GitHub uh, command line uh, tool here. Uh, there's a note here how you do that. We'll not cover this in this tutorial because to use the GitHub command line tool, you need to set up and authenticate that tool to your GitHub account. But there's more information on that here. Uh, the other way is to do fetching and uh, sync sync that way. So. Uh, does anyone have any like questions or difficulties or anything so far? Anything at all? Okay, just kind of put your hand up and shout at me if you do. So um, if I do git remote v here, not remote, remove remote. You see, I've got this origin here, which is where I am. If you do remote add and then do the GitHub. Gen 5, Gen 5. Oh, sorry, I want to add, uh, I want to call this upstream. That's typically what you call this. Upstream. So that's git remote v. We've added the uh, main GitHub repo as our upstream, whereas my forked version is here. And I can do git fetch. Uh, upstream. Oop, well, that's all works. Just got a lot of tags there. If I go to git switch develop, and I can git merge upstream develop, there I have synced my local cloned repo with that of the main Gem5 repository, and I maybe can't push here, but I will just, and then I could push this if I wanted to, but I'm not, I don't think I put my keys set up here on this code space to do so. But I'd push, and then my forked version on GitHub would also be up to date. And that means it's, think, that means it's, uh, my, my, my forked developed branch is up to sync with the Gem5 
main develop branch. And that's why I keep these uh, branches separate here. So git uh, branch. I keep my changes separate. If I switch to my changes, I can merge develop in, and they were all today here. Cool. So yeah, just that's just good housekeeping as far as I'm concerned. And yeah, this is all in the slides. The slides should be pretty helpful for people who want to reference this later. So making changes as making changes and actually submitting. So we are on a new branch, we're on our, we've cloned, we, we've, sorry, we've forked, we've cloned, we've created a new branch from, from like develop, let's actually make some changes and how would you submit them? Okay, I already went over that part. So um, these commands here are pretty straightforward. I'm gonna just kind of do these in a bit, but let's just create a, I'm gonna show you creating a simple hello world file, adding it, adding it, and then updating that file in another commit. So we're gonna create two, we're gonna get two commits here. And the only kind of caveat, which I will explain in a bit, the commit messages should have this misc colon starting off. Uh, I will explain that in a bit, but that is, things might go wrong if you don't put that in. So I'm just gonna create a file called hello.txt, and it doesn't matter really at all what's inside here. I'm gonna git add hello txt and then git commit dash m and say misc m i s c and I'm gonna say as add hello.txt. And let's say, oh no, I want to add uh, another line to hello.txt, hello again. I'm gonna git add that file again. And I'm gonna git commit and add another commit. Misc, and I'm gonna say something like updating hello.txt. And if you want to see, make sure it has actually been added correctly, you can do git log. And you can see me, kind of as Jason in this case, I've added uh, we added the hello, the, the hello and then we updated it. So these are two commits. And I'm not, I can't demonstrate this here because it's not really logged in, but if I, if I uh, had authenticated this repo correctly, I could do git push and push this branch to my GitHub account. I might get my forked Gem5 repository on GitHub and that would be there in a new branch stored all my changes. You'd run this command first, you have to set the upstream, and uh, you would then just, that would push your changes to GitHub. I have a little disclaimer here for people who are confused. The term upstream is overused in, uh, in Git, uh, but in this case, by upstream, we mean the, uh, my forked Gem5 repo in GitHub. So just push. From here, you can actually create a pull request. So, so that should be something I can maybe demonstrate. So I'm gonna actually see if, I'm just gonna jump into Jason's repo here. See if Jason has some forked repository. Yeah, forked from here. I'm not gonna do anything, but you find, you go to your, something like this. So we go to the branch we pushed. Imagine here it's just append kernels args. Don't worry, Jason, I won't actually create a PR here. And you click contribute, and you do open pull request. I'll, I won't add. And then this is basically, this is basically a form you fill out to create your pull request to the Gen5 repo. Caveat here, we are not targeting the stable branch. We're targeting the, we're targeting the develop branch. You put your title here of your change. You add a description. Be nice if you added some labels. You got some labels here, such as like Arch Risk Five. That is, your change has something to do with the Risk Five ISA, Vega, Base, Base Stat. It's a bug. It's a build error fix. Classic caches. I think we got like 30 of these. So let's just say, oh, we're doing something to do with uh, the minor CPU 
uh, inside for the risk 5 ISA, put these pags there. None of the rest here probably thing if, yep. Um, fill this out to be pretty detailed. Uh, more detail on your change is better, but we realize some things are pretty straightforward, like this is just a typo fix or something. And then I'm not going to do this here, but you just click create pull request, and that pull request will be created inside the RGM5 project. So I'm going to show you that now. Like, we're going to show you, and they, this is their pull request page as it is right now. These are all pull requests waiting to be merged into Jam 5. Um, who am I going to bully to show an example? I wonder if I put something here. Uh, no, I'll just do my R. Sorry, my R. This is your pull request. So he's going to add, he's going to add modification support in the standard library. And actually, my R, thank you. You've done a really good job here because there is a label. I'll say that this is to do with the standard library. Uh, he's actually assigned reviewers, which is nice, uh, meaning he's assigned people who he wants to look at this. That's Jason and that's me here. I haven't reviewed this yet, despite him asking me to do so like a week and a half ago. So there you go. Uh, he's done a nice description uh, of what this does. This implements the, a capacity in abstract board to allow running user-defined code to instantiate, da, 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 da. very good. A nice title, and, it's, and it consists of two commits. Uh, one is uh, he is adding modification support to the standard library, and then one he's run this, I'm gonna go more on this a bit, he's run this black formatting tool on it. So clearly at some point we said this isn't formatted correctly, so we ran the formatter on it. And this is gonna example some back and forth. Um, Jason has had a few small complaints here. <laughs> Lol, this line shouldn't change. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> What's Jason's comment here? Uh, can you either revert the style changes in this file or, or, or like create two commits? You know, these are all, these are all been addressed. Can you show an example of a use case here? You know, I don't know what this code was, but clearly J he wrote some code and wanted some example of a use case. Meyer has pushed this, and he said the comments have been addressed, and we haven't got back to him yet. This here is our uh, checks. So these are all tests that are run on the PR. It's quite a, it's quite a lot. These are all quite short but in total it maybe takes two hours to complete. So for example, um, what's the example? Oh, I'll just do the pre-commit, we're about to go that into anyway. Um, so this is when the pre-commit checks, which ones, where does the actual stuff actually happen here? Yeah, so this is checking things like uh, no trailing white space in any of the files passed, fix end of line files. So we have a particular standard and what end of line file uh, Find the files. Check all the, check all the YAMLs are in the correct YAML format. Check for any merge conflicts. Check for any broken sim links. Check for any destroyed sim links. Check for uh, the requirements.txt. Check, and there's various other ones down here that, uh, you know, various kind of checks this thing does on the code base before being allowed in. My R has passed all, the passed all the checks, so nothing to worry about. Got other ones here like uh, our Py unit tests. So these are Python unit tests. Um, that is it, no, it's, we got this one here. They all passed, it, set, it comes up as one, but this is one that actually contains all the Python unit tests, so it passed. Uh, same, it passed uh, our, yeah, we do, a, we do a compilation in Clang, because this, everything else runs GCC by default, that's also one, so yeah, he's passed everything. <sighs> so uh, that's essentially what pull requests look like. Uh, you can see ones that have been closed, merged, and some of them just aren't, you know. Uh, so everything's here, and we've got about, well this is, well, this is deceiving, because you can, you can also push, you can also put a pull request that's a, as a draft. So this is the example of a draft pull request. Uh, we don't review it, it's still waiting. So you might want to push things as a draft if you're not really finished working on it, but for some reason you want. <laughs> Maybe, maybe, maybe people to be able to see it, or maybe just as a backup, backup of your work as well. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, the dra so drafts in GitHub don't really work the way I would have them work. The first thing is <laughs> they do appear on this page 
they're not like hidden, they're there, and people sometimes get confused and think they're not drafts, they're actually just genuine pull requests. Second of all, you, if you do anything in a draft, no one will get email updates about it. So sometimes people can be pu putting messages in draft PRs saying, hey, can, you, hey, can you guys look at this please? And no one gets emails about it. So just be, too, just be cautious of these two things with drafts uh, in, in uh, GitHub PRs. GitHub, for as, some, as a group who works entirely in GitHub, like, it's really, really hard for us to tune GitHub notifications to be useful. They either spam you incessantly with almost everything or they give you no information whatsoever and there's just no in between, so it's really annoying. <laughs> but so, if we don't respond to your message, it might just be because you're either a drop in the ocean of messages we get or it's just not getting through at all. It's one of those two. Um, so that's PR. Uh, Side channel is emailing us directly and saying, hey, uh, I, I, hey I, I would say two weeks is the line in the sand we try to give people. If we really haven't responded to you in two weeks, we've dropped the ball. Like we should have maybe at least said, oh yeah, sure, we'll look at this. Uh, so we do try to get it seen to everyone in about two weeks, give or take. If we haven't, you might have just fell, fell, might have fell by the wayside in one way or another. We don't mind if after like a week and a half you just ping us and go, like literally people do, hey, ping on this. Like that's literally like their comment, like hey, still here, uh, still waiting on something. That's okay, we don't get mad at stuff like that. Maybe if you do that every single day for like a week, we get pretty annoyed, but if once every week or once every two weeks is kind of fine. Um, and this is kind of broadly going over what I'm So the PR review process, um, you saw those tests I went through. To, for, a, for a PR to be merged, all those tests must pass. Those tests start running the moment you create the pull request. Take about two hours to run, and you should get feedback pretty quickly if one of them passes or fails or not. So, uh, for instance, uh, we're gonna, I'm going to go more into testing after this, but uh, let's say uh, we have some tests that run x86, uh, booting an OS in x86. Maybe these might fail because you messed up implementing an x86 instruction and now things are broken. You will just have to go and fix that and re-push and, and see if the CI tests pass. And then the reviewers must approve the change. We generally say two separate people have to give the thumbs up to the change. Um, so remember how Mayar had tagged me and Jason as reviewers. So I think Jason gave it a thumbs up or requested some feedback. And I've still got to go, and go in and give that feedback as well. So when both these conditions are met, the test passed and two, two reviewers PR. The, pro the way we do things is at that point, a Gen 5 maintainer, which I won't bore you on the politics of Gen 5, but Gen 5 maintainers are uh, Gen 5 contributors of slightly elevated status. They can then merge your request. So I basically go with me and a couple other people go through pretty much every morning, going through to see which PRs have the test pass and two good reviews. If that's the case, we go in and we merge, we merge the PR on your behalf, and that's it done. You're done, you're in the code base. You can go and clone the Gen 5 repo. You can go to the develop branch and see your change there. That's you in, all done. <laughs> Uh, so that's the kind of process. Uh, but if you just submit a PR, we can guide you through that process. Uh, you know, we're, we're gonna keep you in the loop. We'll, we'll tell you if tests are passed. You know, it's, uh, it's okay. It's pretty intuitive once you've done a couple of PRs or even just one. So updating PR. I just said you, 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 you like submit something, the tests fail, and you have to re-push. Well, this is how you do it. You go to your branch and you make the change, you, you, you like commit and then you push. Because all this is, uh, sorry, where do I want to here? I'm gonna go back to, uh, any random one here. This here is just a branch on someone else's repo. So this PR here this is Roger Chang's branch here on his repo. So this is Roger Chang's Gen 5, and this is the branch he made to create the pull request from. If he wants to update this PR, he just pushes changes to this branch, because this is essentially just the same branch. So all you would have to do locally 
you just make a change. So here I've done an example that I guess I won't bother doing uh, locally here is, okay, they, want, they need the word blah in this hello.txt file or else no one's happy. Do it, commit it, push it, update that branch. That branch is gonna be mirrored on the PR because the PR is just the branch. So any kind of questions about this kind of PR process and how you update it and how things are reviewed? This is, I would say, largely conventional with how uh, contributing, to op contributing to projects on GitHub works. So if I sound confusing to you, you can probably just Google the words pull, like, pull request, he uh, help me or something, and there'll be various pages that can help you out. Uh, this, is, this is pretty standard uh, procedure. I focus mainly on making commits to your branch. Uh, sometimes we prefer rebases. Use rebases carefully. You can really like delete all your branch with rebases pretty easily <laughs> and cause problems. But they're good for things like merging. I'd say they're good for merging commits and renaming commits, i.e. getting like renaming the commits, rewording the commit messages. Um, this command here, like I uh, rebase I head and then the amount of uh, commits you want to actually manage. So I'll show you briefly, I do this very cautiously here. I'm gonna re re get rebase dash I, which means interactive rebase, head, I'm going to two here. So this is my last two commits, the repo, and I can do things like, oh, I don't like the wording of this commit, so I'm gonna do reword. And actually, this commit here can be, mer can be what we call fixed up. So if you read the description down here, fixed up is like squash, but it pushes, it pushes or merges that commit with the previous one. So I want that to be part of the add hello one. So fix up. If I just exit this, first thing that's gonna do is allow me to reword this. So I'm gonna add hello and more. Description, description here, for example. If you get log, you can see the changes here. As I've been made. So that's the kind of power of get rebase. You can kind of change history. So some, I, 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 this comes up every so often. You read someone, or someone will tell you that Git is like a, a logging system that preserves history. It doesn't at all. With rebase, you can completely, you can completely change Git's history as much as you want. I could, using Git rebase, I could completely change uh, every single commit in the Gen5 repository if I wanted to. And that's what Git rebase basically allows you to do. Um, which you shouldn't do and we won't allow you to do, but for your own kind of branch, we c you can manage it to make it look all neat and it's nice to make everything very neat. It's a very common case in using rebases as a, you like have a commit that puts in a feature, then like six commits are like fixing typo on page one, fixing typo on page two, fixing typo on page three, fixing typo on page four. With rebase, you can just merge that all down into the first commit to make it look like you got it right the first time, you know? So that's kind of power of rebases. Just use with caution, I would say, because you can kind of, it's possible, I'll, I'll demonstrate here something you can do with rebases. Uh, I just deleted that change completely from my, my, my local repo. It's not there anymore. So you can kind of delete even your own changes quite easily. Um, again, I go through some examples here which you can ask inside. You can reorder the commit messages. Oh, sorry, you can reorder the commits, rather. You can delete commits, which I just demonstrated. You can, ta you can t uh, commit messages to be, like, like re you, you can allow, you can reword the commit messages. Um, I guess just go here. Uh, the rebus errors can arise uh, similar to merge issues. If you've merged, they're kind of the same thing. Uh, and it's, you can kind of cause a lot of damage if you don't know what you're doing, uh, so just use it with caution. Okay, um, I went over how to use Git and PRs, and now I'm gonna go into the Gem5 project-specific requirements uh, that I most, well, I think everything here is pretty much, sti pretty much style guide and some commit message guidelines here. Um, so even, so the basic requirements for getting your PR to be accepted are number one, 
I, I guess I've ignored a giant thing here. Outside of this CI test passing, I will say, the other requirements are the Gem5 must conform to the style guide, both in Python and C++. The commit messages must be in the same format and contain tags. That's, I'm going to go over that in a bit, but that was the misc thing you had to type in before, a tag. And the commit messages have to contain a change ID. I really want to drop this requirement, but right as, as of the time of speaking, you do require a change ID in your commit messages. So I'm going to go over that in the coming slides. Um, so fortunately, there's a tool that pretty much does all this for you. <laughs> it, it's like called pre-commit. And pre-commit uh, is essentially a git hook, if you know what that is, that every single time you, ty you type git commit, it runs a series of checks on your code base to make sure that that commit conforms to the Gem5 uh, style guides and other requirements. Uh, right now, it will completely format your, it'll automatically detect and reformat incorrect Python for you, so incorrect, incorrect Python style for you, and it'll add, miss, I'll add, add missing commit IDs. You don't have to worry about that. It will warn, but not correct, uh, when you've done commit messages that are not in the correct format and don't have the incorrect tags included. And for C++ formatting, it does some checks and some fixes, but not everything. I would generally say this, for, for Python formatting, we've got complete automated processes now that will take your Python and format it the way we want it to do. You don't really need to worry about it. C++ is still a very manual process right now. So, uh, yeah. So, I would say one of the first things you do when you get, when you download a Gen5 repo is run this, which is a util, uh, a pre, util pre commit install. I'll do that here as an example. And that, uh, that installs these hooks. And then when you make changes, ah, this is goodbye. We do a commit here. It starts running, well, Starts running some tests. First, it needs to install the packages. That's what it does the first time. It's doing here. There, uh, I'll just do misc. Whatever. So you see here, it ran a bunch of checks on my commit before allowing me to commit it. And everything passed. Of course, everything passed. I wasn't really doing anything, just writing some stuff in a text file. But we can add in some errors here. So let's just, if I go in, so one of the ones it checks for is uh, no white space at the end of uh, lines. So if I go, I believe, let's go to something like source base. Uh, host info, why not? That'll do. Uh, there. Go down. And I'm just going to add some. I'm just going to add some chaos to this. I'm going to say, uh, you know, white space here. Yeah. I try to add this. Yep, trailing white space found and modified it, fixing. Oh, I do, and you'll see that it's made this fix. If I do di git diff, it's removed the white space. This diff isn't very good at showing it, but done so. So it'll make the changes for you and not allow you to commit. So it's a pretty handy thing to do and have. I'll leave this mostly for your own time, but you can, you can play around with this. You can install the pre-commit and try to do things. So try adding like what I did here, adding random white space and see what happens. Try adding, uh, yeah, uh, you can also see, I might as well show this. It's added the change ID to my commit I made before automatically. I didn't have to do that myself. I'm not going to explain to you why change ID is important, because frankly, they're not really that important, but it's still a requirement to commit changes to the project. 
if you have pre-commit installed or add these change IDs to, to your commit message, I think that's all you need, really, really, really need to worry about right now. Uh, and you can do various other things to see. Uh, and you can add a commit without this misc tag, and it'll just fail. So I guess I can show you doing this very quickly. Yep, it says here, oh, it's still complaining about the white space. Anyway, when it got to the commit, if you, did it, if you tried to commit without, the, without the, the tags, without the little misc colon thing, it would also complain. Go, speaking of the tags, uh, a commit message, uh, we have various things a uh, commit message has to have to be compliant in Gen 5. Uh, I think of only two of them are actually enforced, and the other ones are just recommendations. The first one is the header, that is the first line in a commit message, has to be no greater than 65 characters, including the tags. Second one thing, each header has, should, be, should start with at least one tag separated by a comma, then a colon for the header. And the list of valid tags is in maintainers.yaml. So here we've got test base, for example. Those are valid tags and you can find a list of tags inside the gem5 code base. Containers at YAML. So say arch, arch arm, arch vega, base, base stats, configs, CPU. They have the description here, so CPU is general changes for all CPU models, i.e. base CPU, CPU KVM, uh, not all of these have the descriptions, it's a bit unhelpful. EXT test lab, et cetera. So historically, this file was used to actually decide who was maintaining what. Now I would say it's just the list of tags that we need to have in our commit message for, to keep kind of track of what's documenting what. It's quite good for some, so some of our developers really like being able to quickly see what, uh, a, ch what a commit's about just from looking at the tags. So there's some people at ARM who basically just sit through and look for changes that come up that say arch ARM, and they go, oh, this is something to do with us, cool. And they jump in and they see what that commit's about. Um, so that's why we kind of require it. When in doubt, just use MISC, which is like, well, not, not when in doubt, that's, that's bad policy. Try to find a tag that best suits you, but if nothing fits, we have this like miscellaneous MISC tag that I use for like things that don't really fit into anything else. Definitely try to tag the right ISA. Again, you can use commas to add multiple. Stuff to do with Python, you've got Python here. Uh, scones for our build system. Uh, SE, SE mode emulation is here. System C. So let's try to add that to the commit message. So yeah, first thing, add the tags, and the commit message header has to be no longer than 65 characters. Description afterwards is nice to have and definitely advisable to further go into detail about what the commit does. Those lines should be low lo low longer than 60, 72 characters um, in length. And at the bottom here, if you can tag, if you, we like if, you, if this commit references an issue that's already been uh, recorded in, a, in our GitHub issues, then I just do issue, colon, and then the URL. So it references back. And you can see, oh, this fixes this bug, or this is implementing this feature, cool. A little callback is quite useful for helping us kind of manage the project. So I'd say the important ones are include the tags, at least one. Tags must be from the maintainers.yaml file. And headers should be a little longer than 65 characters. That's, these are enforced. The CI tests will fail if these aren't included. But recommended but not enforced. A description of the change. Description of the line length. Uh, sorry, I just, I, I, and yeah, and then the description line length less than 72 characters. This is recommended, but not actually enforced. There's some reasons you might need to go over that line length. Let's say pasting a URL, which is just more than 72 characters, for example. And a link to the issue change address. I, sorry, a link to the issue should be uh, thing at the bottom is also quite useful for us to uh, know what this is actually in relevance to if it, rel if it relates to some known issue that we've recorded in our issues page. Now to go into the Gen 5 coding style. Python, I'll keep very, very brief because it's very, very simple, which I'm very grateful for. We use Python Black. 
Python block is a formatting tool. Python block has very, very little configurability. If you download Python block and run it on your Python code, it'll automatically format it completely to our style guide, and you will be able to commit that to Gem5 with no complaints. During the pre-commit process, pre-commit uses Python block on, your, on, the, on the files you've modified and automatically format them to the right format. I've not had to think about Python style, I Python styling since this was implemented. Just go with it. Uh, outside that, we have no Python style guide. Uh, just use what Black says and keep things sensible. Um, the one that's actually harder is the C++ because we're working on using, uh, what's it called again, Clang format. Um, we are trying to uh, have an automatic C++ style formatter, but it's a political nightmare because everyone has different ideas of what this, the format should be, and we're never, ever getting through it. This is, and I would also have this as a giant disclaimer, that uh, there's 100% for every single one of these rules, cases in Gem5 code base where these are not used or done in the correct way. So it's not a very heavily enforced style guide, but these are, this is our style guide. I won't go over these in too much detail because they're all on our website and you won't properly remember them. Uh, big one is lines must be no longer than 79 characters. Indentation is for tabs. Use spaces, not tabs. I think these are the, bi the biggest ones that are probably uh, get under people's skin the most. We've got rules and control blocks in general. Uh, these should be in curly brackets, except in some cases. Uh, and function type returns should be on their own line. Here's an example of some well-formatted code in accordance to our style guide. Spacing, uh, yeah, there's some spacing rules about IE spacing around uh, Udemy operators and things like this, and no space around equals when the parameter argument, blah, 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 blah. You can read this all in your spare time because I don't think you're really going to remember it if I just monologue it to you. But these are general spacing. And we have naming uh, guidelines as well. In general, it's camel case. Camel case with a capital for classes, add camel case starting with a lower case for uh, variables, and then we have some rules about accessor functions and accessor member variables. And for local variables, local variables we use snake case. Then general rule, if you're modifying a Gem5 file, just use the style that a file is already using, infer it, and then use that style, and then you'll be good to go. Uh, which is not a very satisfying answer, but it is the answer. So yeah, just use, if you're modifying a file, you see that it's using snake case for everything, use snake case. If it's not, use something else. If it's got funny spacing, use their funny spacing and continue with that until we can find some sort of automated way to deal with this. But this is the general style guide, which I guess you should conform to if you're just creating a new file, for instance. I've been asked by Jason to speed things up a little bit, but this is another example of using uh, our kind of style guide with the funny underscore for accessor met accessor functions and things like this. We have rules to do with include blocks, which I'll let you read over in your own time, but if you're including lots of things, you break them down into blocks. The first one should be the python.h if it's there, and then your main headers, and then the C includes, and the C++ plus includes, and then the shared ones that are included in the include file, and then finally the M5 includes. So there's an order to these. You can look this over in your own time. So if you know the style guide, you have everything you know to contribute to Gem5. Congratulations. Uh, I'll get into the Gem5 tests. So part of, this is really, I couple this, with, I couple this with contributing because this is how you demonstrate that your tests, your, your contribution to Gem5 actually works the way you say it should. So to me, it's kind of a part of contributing. Sorry, this big screen. In general, would ask all contributions to come with tests. In practice, we don't, but we would strongly encourage testing. So a feature isn't tested, we generally just say we don't support it as well. So you might have heard Jason say, this, is not, this, this isn't currently supported. And what we mean by that is it's not tested. Therefore, it may or may not work. We have no idea. You're on your own. It's sort of the situation if something isn't tested. Um, if you want to add a new feature, we generally ask you to add a test. 
and adding tests allows us to have confidence that this feature isn't going to break things going forward and is in some sense maintained and supported. So testing in that sense is quite important. We have four broad categories of tests. I do have a disclaimer down here that not all tests are covered in these categories, but this is where the large, large bulk of them are. Um, first one is the C++ unit tests. Those are, these are written in the Gen 5 Google test framework, and they run on C++ codes. They're, so they're C++ unit tests. And ditto, we have something for Python, the Py unit tests, and these are Python unit tests, and we have a framework for that. Then we have the test lib tests. This is kind of a home-baked testing framework-ish that runs Gen5 simulations, and through that verifies output and testing code and exit codes. Very kind of high-level integration tests we sometimes think, think of these as. Lastly, of, of the compilation tests. Sorry, and these um, just tests that Gen5 compiles in various uh, environments using various different compilers and various different configurations of Gen5. So we might want to test that the messy three-level Gen5 compilation for RISC V compiles with, uh, with the Clang 6 compiler. That's the sort of test that the compiler tests do. Massive cross, massive cross product of all, this, all, all our supported compile, compilers and supported kind of compilations of Gen5. We run these at different times. I've talked about the CI tests that are run on when every single, whenever a PR is pushed or updated. Um, and these run the bulk, if not all, of the C++ and Python unit tests and a subset of the test slip tests and compilation tests. These are designed to run quickly in, other, in under four hours, I would say most of the time, somewhere between two and three hours. Then we have the daily tests. These are just scheduled every single night, every single, I say daily because we, we're not in a specific time zone, but in California time, they're, not, they're at night, so they run at night. Um, and these take about 12 hours to complete. So they're slightly longer tests that we run. Then we have weekly tests that we run every single week, uh, normally at the weekend. And these could take one to two days to complete. So these are very, very intensive simulations that we want to like test that they still function. So maybe the NAS parallel benchmarks we'll run every single week just to make sure that they're still functioning correctly. And the compiler tests are also run every week and they typically take about 12 hours to run. These all run through GitHub Actions. Um, if you don't know anything about GitHub Actions, it's, GitHub Actions is um, kind of a service that GitHub offers to run tests and other various automated tasks for GitHub projects. You can look at these in the, you can look see how these are configured in the get, .github slash workflows directory inside the Gen5 repository. Um, we won't go over these in these sessions, but these are YAML files that just define how, are, how these tests and when these tests are run. And these tests are run, almost all of these tests are run on self-hosted runners. That means servers that we actually own. Uh, the, well, I was gonna say the bulk of which, well, I was gonna say, but that's a lie, all of which are run at Wisconsin on the server called Loop. Uh, does anyone want to give me a quick, does anyone know why, the, why having a server, a testing server called Loop is very, very clever? Okay, no? Do you know these like glasses that people inspect gems with? Like the little, these little ones? Those are called loops. So loops inspect gems, gem five, our testing server is called loop. Everyone laugh now, please. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay, okay. Okay, cool, great, that was really buddy. I don't know who came up with that, but that was, do you ever? Okay, oh yeah, okay. Very, very funny. Um, um, I will, and I know I've, I promised Jason I would do this session quite quickly, but I will go into GitHub Actions to kind of show you guys what goes on behind the scenes here. This is what GitHub Actions looks like. I'm not sure how much people who are not maintainers in this project can see. I'm not even sure if this button exists up here, but for us, we can go down to our compiler tests, for example. I did not know our compiler tests were failing. Okay, <laughs> we can jump in and we see t the test here, Let's see all, What's well, currently filling for us? That's interesting. Uh, sorry, that was oh, it's down the side here. We'll have one. Okay, cool. Clang seven is not compiling correctly, and we can see why. Someone must have pushed something weird. I sure hope this is a real bug and not something. Uh, what 
this is, uh, implicit float conversion error at a certain point. So yeah, that's an example of one of our uh, compiler tasks failing. Uh, I guess that's going to be what I'm going to do on Monday and fix. Uh, so that's, like, so that's what GitHub Actions looks like for us. Uh, all of your continuous integration tests for various PRs are here. So uh, here's an example of, where's a tough decent one? So yeah, here's an example of a PR from Roger, move PMP reset implementation to MMU reset. And all the CI tests passed here. And I assume this has been merged or is not in this process of being merged. Yeah, well, someone's still got to give a review. So those are what our tests look like for us here. Going back here. So uh, for our C++ unit test, we use G-Tests, or the Google Unit Testing Framework, I think is its full name. Um, and I think the only caveat here is we do have to link it into our build system via this funny G-Test command, G-Test um, function inside the scon script. Outside that, they look pretty typical of anyone who's ever used G-Test before. So we go to source base bitfields test.test, test.cc, uh, source, base, uh, test.cc. You can see these are pretty test. We expect that a mask of zero is equal to zero. We expect a mask of one is equal to one. All things here. And this is testing bitfield.cc, because I think if you go to the top here, yep, we're Im importing this here. If you go down to the scon script, which defines how this is compiled, Yeah, here's the here's here here's the two where we define it as a test, saying hey bitfield.test it is this file linked with this comp compilation of this file, pretty straightforward, pretty good unit test, all things considered. And to build and run this this particular unit test, we'd run this and then this and this command here. So I'm just going to show you that very briefly because this should be quick. If I can just copy and paste this. command here that I'll just copy and paste for when that's busy, when that's completed. And we can run the test using this. You see, test passed. All these unit tests in here to find a file. I've all run OK. We're good to go. And I won't do this here, but you can literally run all the unit tests using this command here. Scones build all unit tests obt. I won't do that because it'll take a while to compile. But that is also you, that, that, will, that, will not, that, that one, you don't, you don't need a separate run step. Scones will just automatically run the test after compilation with that command. Python unit tests uh, are unit tests for the Python side of Gen 5. Uh, you can find them in tests, PyUnit, pi test PyUnit, and this one here is a pretty good uh, example. So uh, util PyUnit conversion check. Uh, so if I go into test, tests, PyUnit, tell. This is using the standard PyUnit testing framework. Import unit test. And you can, like, this is all standard. So if you Google Python unit test, you'll see how this is all done. Essentially, you create a class which is uh, inherits from unit test to test case, and you create your tests here. I believe they all have to start with test underscore to run correctly. And here, we're doing two metric float. Uh, so we're saying, this is checking uh, 
our M5 util conversion utility. So we're saying, hey, uh, this uh, convert this uh, two metric float has to return correctly. So we're saying, hey, 42 has to return this, 42.5 has to return this, 42.5 kx has to return this, etc. You can see how we talked about this earlier: the killa, the killas, and the kibas and the jiggas, <laughs> uh, this is what this is testing here, that all the Python code actually functions correctly. Um, and to run these, you have to use the Gem5 utility, but Gem5 tests run PyUnit will run these. Uh, and if you want to specify a directory, a specific directory of tests to run, you can. So here we're just saying just run the test util tests that are in the tests.util directory of what we've just been looking at. So I think, whoop, I think this will work. Cool, yeah. Here we run all the tests, run 17 tests. Okay, everything's fine. That's how you would use and run the, the PyUnit tests. Again, these are run as part of the CI tests. These are run every single time you push a PR to Gen 5. Does anyone have any questions? Comments? Nope. Okay. If a test fails, how should they look into it? How do you recommend that they try and fix it? If a test fails, it will each one of these tests should be specific enough to know immediately what the error is. So let's say you have a test to test to IP netmask failure, then you'll know the code that's failed is somewhere in your two IP test mask code. So is this, I don't know exactly where that lives right now. Um, yeah, so this is, com this is a testing the two network band, oh, that one's too different. Yeah, two network bandwidth code here. And if the exit here, you know the, the, the problem is in, your, in this function, in the two network conversion code, for example. And you should just go into wherever that code lives inside M5 and try to fix it. Um, uh, often a common problem is, is if you just wrote, if you just written tests, often the problem is you just wrote the tests incorrectly, which uh, sometimes happens. So. Uh, make sure you've written the test correctly. Outside that, it's errors to your code, and your unit test should be unit testy enough to know where the error is. Because unit test should really be testing a single function, ideally. So if a test fails, the error is in that function, or some function that that function depends upon. If there's a zag fault, it should be printed here in the terminal. And the error, if so I'm pretty sure if we do that, for example, I think that will cause an error. I'll see. No, I can't. I don't know why that works. <laughs> uh, well, if there is an error, it will output here. And if it's a stack trace, it'll be a stack trace. And if it's, but if you do, a lot of these assert equals will have their own error handling code and will tell you, got this, expected this from this function, for example. So you will be able to be able to go back and see how these tests fail. Um, Compiler tests, I'm not really going to go over because these are more automated. These are much more automated and incorporated into our GitHub Actions infrastructure. Uh, but you can go through, but these will fail normally just because a newer version of Clang has came out and it's got these checks that we haven't really tried before and uh, they'll tell us some new optimization that we're not doing and that's typical compiler error for us. The test slip uh, is where most of our testing happens, and 
It's a very much rolled our own testing framework. I think this, is, this was based on something at some point, like an open source piece of software called Testlib. That I've, no, it, it, I've, Jason's shaking his head, but I, I think this is, I'm certain this is true. Well, I've seen Teslib and other open source projects before. It's very similar to this. So I think it was heavily based on something that's already existing. But it's been so hacked together to make it work for this project that it's very much our own thing. And it's, it's got lots of caveats, which I'm not going to torture you all with. But essentially, at its core, all it does is it takes Gen 5 configuration scripts and runs them, and normally at least, well, at least checks the exit codes, i.e. checks that the simulation actually exited correctly. Often, but not always, will also check various other outputs, like they've outputted to the right file, and they've outputted to um, the terminal correctly. Um, for instance, checking x86 boot tests is a common example of this. Um, so to use these Tesla tests, you go into the testing directory. And the main accessor for this is main.py. And again, this won't do anything because we've not done anything. I think we we help is more easy here. Yep. Um, main.py, and this is how you access the Tesla. You can run them. You can list them. You can rerun them. Uh, run and list, what we will think, most common things here. So we want to list all the tests here. We do list. This is listed a uh, heck of a lot of tests here that we run. Uh, and there's different lengths. So by default, this will get all the quick test lib tests that are run as part of our CI tests. But if you want to list all the ones that are done as part of our daily tests, Length goes long. Also, the ones that are done as part of our daily tests. These are all tests here. Again, these may not. You see, the uh, first part of the test here is the actual file that these are executed from. That's quite useful. And these define the tests, which I'm going to go over just in a bit. And for the sake of it, we have one more, which is very long. And these are run as part of our weekly tests. For example, yeah. Some of our x86 boot tests are run as part of our weekly tests. So I think going to test Gen 5, M5 util is a good example of uh, how a test of test is properly declared. So here in this directory here, we have first of all a config directory. And in the case, we just have a standard Gen 5 configuration file. Uh, this one here, we take in a resource. And resource directory is just where we want the resources to be downloaded. And we just run this in a basic SE mode simulation and stop. So this is the most basic config script you can possibly get. It downloads a resource and it runs it in, in the SE mode. And our test or exit here, you can broadly ignore this first part. This is setting up this, well, this part. It's broadly just setting up where we want the resources to be downloaded. What we're defining here is via the Gen5 verify config file, we're saying we want a test named N5 exit test. It's going to take in this configuration script with these arguments passed to it. and uh, in this case, uh, using the all compiled. So that means we want, I'll just put a comment in here. So this one, we want build all Jam 5 to OPT. So we want to run 
all Gen5 to OPT on this configuration script with these parameters. And we're going to verify the first of all, this, 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 this simulate, this completes with a zero exit code. That's by default. We've also got this regex expression here we're also checking for, which says exit blah, tick, blah, because M5 exit generated, uh, M5 exit instruction encountered. So regex expression, which we're passing to a verifier, which we pass here. A verifier is just an additional check we do as part of this test. We pass it here. So what we're saying is once this is done, match the uh, terminal output to make sure this regex expression is valid. So this is saying this output to this file has to be, has to contain this regex expression. That's all it. The key thing I think to keep in mind is this function here. This is how you declare a test. Name, verifiers, fixtures you can largely ignore. That's kind of almost a deprecated thing now. A path to the config file that you want to run, the arguments to the config file, and this kind of magic thing here is saying what uh, Gem5 ISA we want to target. In this case, it's the kind of all ISAs are fine. If you wanted, we can do arm here would be the equivalent of this, x86. of this. Well, essentially, we set up tests in the test like the testing framework. Does anyone have any questions on that? I'd recommend if you're interested in writing tests to go through a lot of these. There's a lot of examples here. For instance, this is testing KVM. Here, setting these configuration arguments. Here, we're actually setting the different protocols to use. Lengths. We have this file called uses KVM, which is true. Nope. Okay. I'm getting close to time, so uh, I did have an exercise, but I, I talk. These are notes here that you can definitely refresh over that I just kind of went over in person what these constant tags mean and what it means we're targeting, how to run these tests, why not run. Again, this is the entry point to running the tests. This will leave us an exercise for your own time. But I have got the materials there if you want to try it yourself um, for, for writing your own test in TestLib. Um, I think this should be all be pretty straightforward, but provided is, is uh, test.py, and, and we already have this set up for you. And my exercise would be to create a test that runs the example.config.py script without any arguments and verifies it runs correctly, and then add in a verifier to check that it actually outputs the correct uh, output correctly, and so forth. I think you can do this in your own time. The example is pretty straightforward. Well, the example is there in the materials. I believe there's also a completed example if you want to see what it should look like, because uh, in the interest of time, uh, we're all, I've got 45 minutes more to go here, and Jason got some stuff to say. Here's some hints. When you're running main.py, do dash vvvv which gives you a very verbose output that can help you identify errors pretty quickly. Um, also, uh, when you run uh, main.py, it will try to compile everything you need for the tests, regardless whether you already have them built on your system or not. So if you have already have them build, it, built, pass uh, skip build, that can save you a little time. Otherwise, that's everything I have to say about testing.